It's now my great, great pleasure to introduce our next uh, speaker, Richard Forty. Richard is a paleontologist, a writer, and also a broadcaster on geology and natural history. He surveyed the history of life in his book, Life, an Unauthorized Biography, where he considered extinction and survival, but it appears even more so in his more recent book, Survivors, which was also made into a TV series for BBC. He's a researcher, and today will tell us about the long and short stories of extinction. Please give a very, very warm welcome to Richard Forty. Well, I was um, delighted to hear earlier talk, which was proposing to uh, rejuvenate species which had fallen to critically low population levels uh, by using museum material. I've worked for longer, more years than I care to remember at the Natural History Museum, which is not so far from here, just the other side of the park and down Exhibition Road. And uh, we have behind the scenes there millions, I mean many millions, of specimens. And some people, when they go behind the scenes, are just astonished by just how much there is. And they might say, well, what's all this for? And even some of the curators occasionally have been known to look at, let us say, a somewhat moth-eaten hyena skin and say, perhaps we should return this to a place from which no hyena skin returns. Um, in general, though, museums hang on to specimens. And there's a very important lesson here because those specimens often preserve, particularly in this era of DNA and other molecular evidence, preserve considerable chunks of the genome, which can then be employed in all sorts of ways that we wouldn't have dreamt about when those first specimens were first put in a drawer, maybe in the 1960s, or maybe even in the 1860s. Um, and there's a very important cultural lesson here. Museums are there not just to provide attractive displays, but to act as an archive of natural history and a record, a proof, of what we've done to the planet. And when extinctions have proceeded, as they undoubtedly will, it's extraordinary how quickly human beings have a capacity to forget the past. To say, were there really 84 species of beetles on that small island? I don't remember that many. But if you've got a museum where the specimens are preserved, it acts as an archive. I like to think an archive for the conscience, conscience of humanity, as far as the biological world is concerned all of which is a preamble. I thought I'd bring along a real specimen. Um, this, I hope you can see it at the back, is a trilobite. And if Steve Jones thought that working on um, mollusks was a pretty small field, well, I've spent most of my life studying these completely extinct animals, trilobites. But they're wonderful and varied organisms, uh, and they afford a narrative of the past and indeed of extinction. Listening to some of the people talking today, you might think that the extinction was something that was happening now, or at least more importantly happening now than in the past. Well, it's not. Trilobites are extinct, but during their time on Earth, which was a long period, 200 million years, they generated, well, we're still finding new ones every year, but we certainly know 10,000 or more different genera and species of trilobites. Hugely diverse, and extinction was part of their evolution. So there is, extinction is a natural phenomenon. It does happen. So we cannot, whatever we think about what humans are doing to the planet, uh, treat it, treat the biological world as if it was a zoo in which everything has to be preserved. There will be extinctions. There have always been extinctions. Sad to say, my trilobite or trilobites were one of the victims. But most of those extinctions happen at a fairly dignified rate that Georgina briefly referred to as the background rate. There is, of course, no changeless Eden. The world is gradually changing. So we need to return to the past, really, to understand what, we, what goes on at the present and what we should perhaps do about it. Now, there, as well as extinctions, there are survivors, which I looked at in a recent book of mine, um, this is a survivor, and its ancestors lived alongside the trilobites. So by looking at this pearly nautilus, 
We are, to a certain extent, looking back to the ancient world of the trilobites. But you'll notice this particularly beautiful uh, shell has lots of intricate carvings on it, human carvings. Now, this has gone through several mass extinctions, but the thing that seems to threaten it most now is human aesthetics. We like to make ornaments out of these pretty shells. Uh, originally, they were carved out of ones that were washed up on the shore, particularly in New Caledonia, uh, but now people are going after them. And I, it's, I desperately hope that this isn't another shark's fin story. Why do I care? Because, as Georgina's explained, species that are survivors like this from deep in the tree of life have an enormous amount scientifically to tell us about the course of evolution. They tell us about earlier states of the, of the planet, directly from living examples. So we have extinctions on different scales, background and mass. There we are. Um, this is the only graph I'll show. Uh, this is a graph of diversity through time, time being along the bottom. It's a very famous graph in paleontology. And you'll see that it sort of zigzags. And when it goes, plunges down, most notably about well, just over half the way along, that is a period where these background rates are, do not apply. These are the periods of mass extinction, when many, many, many species die simultaneously. And I'm going to focus just on three of those, because this has got to be a very quick talk. Um, they've happened periodically throughout the long history of life. And the real marathon today is pro probably the history of life on Earth, which is more than three billion years. Um, the first major one, uh, this is just to remind me about it, uh, was the so-called snowball Earth. Um, when the Earth froze almost from pole to pole. And this was very early in the history of life, so we had not yet evolved large, complex, multicell organisms. But it must have been a tremendously traumatic event for the life that we had. Curiously enough, after that, life expanded and continued to expand with some quite serious perturbations until um, the next and greatest mass extinction of them all. I've taken these three pictures of the world from a classical work published by Alfred Wegener in the 20s, which at that time illustrated what he called continental drift. Uh, it shows the present geography at the bottom, and the geography, say, 250 million years ago or more, uh, at the top, when it was realized that the continents of the world were joined together in one supercontinent. And it was on that supercontinent, the greatest extinction on and around that supercontinent that the world has seen happened. Uh, most paleontologists think that 90% of species were exterminated then. So you've got to imagine these survivors that came through that were a really tenuous line coming through a major trauma. Um, why? Well, it's still disputed exactly why. Most people now don't believe that there was an extraterrestrial cause, no meteorite. Uh, it's certainly associated with climate change, and it's certainly associated with a huge, and I mean huge, volcanic eruption or series of eruptions in what is now Siberia, which poisoned the atmosphere, and worse, um, the seas as well. So uh, most of the seas became extremely hostile to life and are anoxic. Uh, and on the land, a single united landmass lost most of the variety of habitats that had existed before into single homogeneous, homogenized habitat, a lot of which was, was extremely arid. So very few things could survive. Uh, and until a few years ago, it was thought that only one land vertebrate, uh, or large land vertebrate, survived this crisis. The list is now somewhat longer. But nonetheless, very few animals um, could survive this crisis, and this Lystrosaurus uh, is probably uh, the only animal in the history of life that's been able to walk from one end of the world to the other over the United Supercontinent. But it was a time of great crisis. But it reset evolution. After that, it was a time of great evolutionary innovation, which I won't outline except to say that this takes us through to what everybody knows as the age of the dinosaurs, uh, um, another very, very varied time of Earth history, 
which came to an abrupt end, this time almost certainly with the intervention of the arrival of a large bolide or meteorite on the Yucatan Peninsula that threw up huge quantities of dust and other poisons into the atmosphere, uh, making life impossible for most large animals. Um, the, these are some of the organisms that did not survive. And it's a, it's a sort of mixed selection, including lower right, a close relative of that surviving nautilus, uh, the ammonite, which was enormously varied during the age of the dinosaurs and died out at this time, but many other organisms besides. The stage was reset, and it did not take more than 10 million years for a huge evolutionary explosion among survivors to produce something approximating to our, uh, or initiating our present world, perhaps rather the larger part of that mammalian part of the tree that Georgina, Georgina illustrated um, previously. Point is, these mass extinctions did actually reset the evolutionary calendar. Um, they were extremely important in the history of the world, and we would not have arrived where we are now had it not been for those mass extinctions. I'm quite sure of it. So I suppose that leads, if you're being... Oh, I should say, not all extinctions, we've seen this already, not all extinctions are extinctions, because we now know that uh, the... And it was, has been speculated ever since the time of Richard Owen, who was the director at my place down the road, we now know that birds and dinosaurs are closely related, and there are a whole scad of dino birds and other intermediate forms, if you like, that span this boundary. So the dinosaurs didn't go extinct. Their survivors are birds. Um, all right, so if I was being brutal, I would say, well, well th then does, it doesn't matter. This is part of the evolution. Mass extinction is part of the story of the Earth. So we've got another one. Um, it's part of the planet's history. Why bother? Why worry? Well, um, of course I worry, like everybody else here, I suspect, because this sixth mass extinction is different. Now, every mass extinction in the past has been its own story. There, are no, it, there is no common theme to mass extinction. They're all a different combination of special circumstances, a triple whammy, if you like. Punches landed from different parts in, uh, of the planet. And the one we're doing, and it is down to us, seems to be different from all of the previous ones. Uh, I mean, first, the first and foremost obvious fact is that unlike any previous mass extinction, the real fundamental cause, biological cause, is the growth in numbers of one species, Homo sapiens, just us. Now, no previous extinction has been like that. Some have had after the extinct mass extinction, the extreme proliferation of a, a crisis species that was able to survive, that's probably what you'd expect. But the causative agent is us, and that's new. Um, some is, something is not new. For example, this is the, on the left, uh, the Greenland ice shelf in 2002, uh, so, and, uh, sorry, 1992. On the right, the shrinking shelf in, in uh, uh, 2002, with an increased melt zone, well, ice caps have waxed and waned throughout uh, Earth's history, and sea levels have risen and fallen. They would inundate many of the places in which lots of people live, and sure, that would be an individual tragedy, but it wouldn't exterminate the species. That's part of, I won't say background, but it's part of the, uh, the regular fluctuations to which the Earth has been subjected. You can't uh, say that the man caused one is different in kind from that. But we are doing things in a different way from any of the previous mass extinctions. It's top down. What we're doing is chopping off the larger animals first, or at least, and Georgina didn't mention this, because reducing numbers of animals alters that ecological web, and most of the things we're taking out are big things at the top and predators. Think of the uh, fantastic diminution in the population of the tiger. And we've been at it for a long time. Uh, this rather wonderful hut um, is built from uh, um, mammoth bones and recovered from Siberia. It's made, of course, by very voracious humans. And 
uh, sadly, those wonderful species are no longer with us. Although they survived into almost histo historic times up in a place called Wrangell Island, miniature versions. And then, of course, this is the first mass extinction which has been abetted by um, the release of carbon dioxide from uh, fossil fuels and other sources. A large pattern in Earth's history has been progressive removal of carbon, very often by limestones, uh, but also in coals and oil and so on. It's sequestered, it's hidden away in the rocks of the planet. Uh, never before, never before, has it been released um, into the atmosphere the way we're doing it. So it's a unique kind of event. Uh, never before um, has species been exterminated out of what I would say vanity. Uh, I think Kauai was mentioned earlier, but there are some wonderful birds there called honey eaters, or I should say there were, because uh, this regal gown was made for a chief. It's in the Bishop Museum in Hawaii. I don't dare calculate how many feathers of this wonderful and beautiful extinct bird there are in it, uh, but we've exterminated, we have exterminated this species for no better reason than our, than our own vain glory. There's nothing like that um, in the history uh, of past extinctions. You know, I think we saw some wonderful film of Bird of Paradise earlier, and Birds of Paradise, of course, um, are uh, another sought-after item of beauty, which almost caused the extinction of many species. So we come back to Darwin, and I'll just finish up by saying, um, Darwin, of course, knew about the dodo. Uh, he knew extinction could happen, but he didn't make a big deal of it um, as a, in, in the origin of species, nor in his subsequent writings. The world seemed to be then still prolific in biodiversity. Uh, if the great man had written more explicitly about it, I wonder if we'd have changed our behavior uh, personally, I don't believe we would one jot. Thank you.